We've got a special guest in studio, and, and it answers, we want this question answered. Like, um, when a Christian takes their own life, that is hard for a lot of us to deal with, because as Christians, you know, we're supposed to be hopeful. And yet when that happens, I don't, I don't know that we have the tools to really do much with that. And that's why um, Darla and I would like to talk to Ben Corson a little bit and find out who Ben Corson is. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I run something called Hope Generation, which is a media outlet to give people sacred optimism, Jesus joy, holy happiness, calm delight. My whole thing is giving people more hope. So I live in Oregon, split my time between there and Southern California, so I'm stoked to be with you guys. Oh, we're glad you're here too. And we have some questions. Um, I, I, we know you have a book, and, and mm -hmm. I can't wait to get to that book. Um, but one of the first questions, if you're in the midst of darkness and it swallows you, like, is there any way to trigger hope? I mean, if you find yourself in it as a Christian and, and you're having a where is Jesus moment? There was something my counselor told me that changed my life, and I cannot underscore or emphasize this enough for people. She told me, stop looking for happiness. Start looking for purpose. She said, if you start chasing meaning, then joy will follow. And I think a lot of times we're looking for these feelings of happiness, these fuzzy emotions to tickle our interior cingulate cortex in our brain and serotonin overflow, and it's elusive. But if we'll instead focus on purpose, if, if, if every morning I get up and I say, what is my meaning? Because as a generation, we have means but no meaning. We have enough to live by, but not enough to live for. So every day, this is called logotherapy, I encourage people to look for meaning and then joy will follow, but not the other way around. Well, Ben, what happens when, you know, this whole last year, everything is shut down, and as a mom, I have three teenagers, mm -hmm. right, looking for meaning, but when all of their meaning kind of just disappears, they're missing their school, they're missing their relationships, all of those things are kind of gone, their athletics are gone, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you convey that to your kid, how are you going to tell your kid there is hope, Yes. You know, right now they're, they're 15, 17, they don't have the life experience, mm -hmm. you know, they don't know, yep what to reflect back on. So how, as a parent, do you convey that to them? Well, I want to share something that helped me because I went through 11 years of clinical depression. This was one of the chief things that helped me out. It's called the 10,000 hour rule. And the idea is, is that if you practice a craft for 10,000 hours, that's the only chance you have of becoming world-class at it. So like the Beatles were playing seven nights a week, eight hours a night, probably felt like eight days a week at a club in Hamburg, Germany. <laughs> I'm glad you got that reference. And they, they were, they played more live shows than most bands do in their entire career before they ever came to America. So the British invasion wasn't a fluke. They had just outworked everybody. And so this is talked about in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, but it changed my life. So what I did when I was depressed is I, I felt so out of control. So I thought, what can I control? I can control if I'm going to hone my craft. And that's the thing. You can take sports away, but you can't take physical training away. Like even if you're locked in your room, you can get after the push-ups. You know, if, if if your kid's an athlete, like you can start getting after just can you do 100 push-ups? Then get after it. You, no one can ever fully take our purpose away from us, and that's something I'm glad you brought that up because I want to clarify that if we'll hone our craft, I think a lot of times we're like waiting for opportunities to roll up. What we need to roll up is our sleeves. Like it. Yeah. Very good. Hey, a question I have for you, because um, the idea of taking your own life mm -hmm. uh, in America, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a friend whose son just took his, and he is devastated. He was talking to the L.A. coroner, and the coroner said, you, you take the last half dozen years, and that's what we have in just this last year. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a horrible thing mm -hmm. that's going on, especially right now. But you know more about this than we do. My question is, how big an issue is this right now in America? It is the issue. It's the issue. Whenever people try to get me off topic to other hot button to the subjects, I just say, nope, depression is the issue. Here's why. Since COVID hit, depression rates have tripled. In fact, April, remember way back April of a year ago, um, there was a 1000% increase of incoming calls for those in emotional distress compared to the April before it. Why? Because I believe partly due to COVID. So here's what I'm saying. Nearly half of Americans have reported that the coronavirus, this was a long time, stat a while ago, has actually exacerbated their mental illness. It's made their mental health worse, worsen. So here's what I want to say. Even before COVID, 
it was terrible. USA Today, 123 suicides per day. 2017, suicide was the second leading cause of death in my age group. Whoa. That's why we have to tackle this and nip this out the bud because once every 40 seconds, someone around the world will commit suicide. That's why I'm so passionate about this message of hope. How do you, how do you give your child hope? I have a friend who has a daughter who committed, her best friend committed suicide, which then triggered the third friend to commit suicide. My daughter's friend is still alive, which now she's sunken into this deep depression. So how does a parent talk to the child yeah. to let them know like there is hope, there's hope? That's good. Okay, there's sociological data that buttresses what you're saying, that suicide is contagious. That, that when one person commits suicide, especially if they're a right. public figure, then it causes a chain reaction. Here's the thing, because parents ask me that a lot. Like, the, what do I tell my kid? This is the, the chief piece of advice I could give, T twofold. Number one, be slow to speak and swift to listen. Because I think the parents with their loving heart want to solve the problem, the best thing you can do is just listen. First and foremost, just say no judgment. I am listening. I am here for you. I've got your back and I'm by your side. We need empathy and sympathy in those moments. As a young generation, that's so important. The second thing I would say is this. Dan Crenshaw, who's a Navy SEAL, he said that one of the chief reasons we're depressed is because as a generation, we've grown so soft that when adversity hits, we don't know how to deal with it. So I always like to encourage young people, like two of my best friends are Navy SEALs and they started Navy SEAL training me and showing me that we're actually forged by adversity, that the limits are in our minds and that these kids are capable of so much more than they think. So encourage them. You might have your nightmares, but you also have dreams right. and you will conquer your nightmares because of your dreams. So listen to them and encourage them in their dreams and, and they can be fortified too. Does social media play into this at all? Because as I was thinking, whenever I go to social media mm -hmm. and, you know, people, we always post the good stuff mm -hmm. uh, and, and it leaves out the bad stuff. So if you're depressed and you're looking at social media and everybody else is living the great life, um, that seems to be a depression cesspool possibility. Well, one of the chief questions I could ask is why is our generation so depressed? And there are theories, but actually the sociological data and research says it's social media that is causing mm -hmm. our depression. Wow. So once every six minutes, 150 times per day, we pull out our phones. And when you're refreshing your feed, you know yeah. how you're doing the same maneuver as a gambling mechanism because it's addicting, the dopamine loop in your brain. You don't know if it's a win or a loss, if it's a like or a thumbs down. So it's very addictive. And what happens is, you know, the classic phrase, we compare our behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels at unfair intervals. It, it's not just that we compare our behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels. It's when we do it. I'm watching a story of you partying when I'm stuck at a red light. You're watching a story of me living it up with my friends when you're bored taking a break from homework. So it's, it's <laughs> when so we're watching. Though. It's when it's not just that we're comparing our behind the scenes with other people's highlight reels. It's that we're doing it at unfair intervals. So everybody's depressed because we're when are we watching stories when we're having a blast no we're watching stories when we're bored hmm. well yeah so how do we interrupt that to let our kids understand mm -hmm. that well, I, 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 my friends, we have this phrase, stop scrolling, start living. Like there are waterfalls to explore. I mean, here in Southern California, there are trails to hike. Yes. There, there's so much life to live. I, can, I, can I give a little piece of advice for everybody? And this is true for me. This is true for you. Go outside and that will help rid you of some of your depression. Maybe we are inside so often addicted to our phones that what's happening is we have Uber Eats, we have Netflix, we have Amazon Prime. We get everything instantaneously. We can even, thanks to COVID, work from home. We could survive the rest of our lives without ever going outside again. And sometimes it's as simple as, I'm not saying this is going to solve your depression, but it right. definitely can help. Go outside. Well, I've heard you talk about prayer walks. Oh, yes. Prayer walks, I would say, is the number one. If I had to really pinpoint the number one thing that saved my life over the years, it's prayer walks. Scientific research shows that talking to God about your hopes, fears, and dreams has the same effect on your brain as therapy.
That's, that's what scientific research. When you talk to God about your hopes, fears, and dreams, it has the same effect on your brain as therapy. And here's the great thing. His therapy is free, and the Bible says in Isaiah, he's a wonderful counselor. There you go. And that happens. That happens. He comforts you. He seriously is. Get with other people. I mean, find yes. a, a believing church. Find people who are actually meeting and go on those prayer walks. Now, you you have a book. It's Flirting with Darkness. Mm -hmm. Is that a little auto autobiographical, that title? Yeah, so I tell my own story. So basically, in a nutshell, my sister died and my brother died and I got diagnosed with complex PTSD and OCD and I was struggling with 11 years of chronic depression and suicide ideation and I almost committed suicide three times and so I, I think a lot so I get trapped in my head and that's not a fun place to be. You said something a moment ago, get with other people. That was one of the biggest things for me as well. I call it friend ventures in the book, going on adventures with God and squad. It wasn't even people, and this is interesting, I had a I have a counselor who helps me through this stuff. But but here's the thing. My friends, they didn't always talk to me about like all the ontological existential navel gazing and trying to riddle out my conundrums. We just skateboarded and they showed me that life could be fun again. <laughs> and sometimes that's what you need. And I actually talk about that in the book. Sometimes you got to like take a whole lot more things a whole lot less seriously. Get out of your head and go with your friends because the federal government did a study that found that loneliness, living in isolation, has the same medical detriment as 15 uh, smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Whoa. Yeah, so in the book, I talk a lot about the importance of community. That's pretty incredible. It's incredible. It's, it's so important, the relationship factors, and that's mm -hmm. the thing with loneliness that's been going on and things like that. So your insight is appreciated. Very, oh, good, very, good. Very much. You also have a list in your book. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to riff through all of them, some of them, the most important ones, I, we yeah. totally recommend the book, by the way. It's called Flirting with Darkness, mm -hmm. wherever you buy your books. I'm sure it's available everywhere. Yeah, it's available everywhere. Okay. So a few of them that I would say is um, one of the, here, the promises of God. I call it scripture scholar scuba gear, which is diving deep into the water of the word. So there are over 3,500 promises in the Bible. How many do you know? How many do you know? Like a lot of a lot of us, like listening to the radio, we can quote Jeremiah twenty nine right. eleven or John yeah. three sixteen, which is great. But there are over three thousand five hundred. Why not take a few more? Those promises helped me through through my depression. Another big one in my case, and I know that a lot of people will relate to this, is if you've had family members who passed away. Paul said, if our hope, 1 Corinthians 15, is in this life only, we above all men are most miserable. So we have to remember that even the grave cannot kill our hope, that when our loved ones die, here's what Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. In Greek, it's do not let your heart shudder. Don't have a heart quake. In my Father's house are many mansions. So even the belief that death can't stop my hope makes me want to live more abundantly today. And one more that I'll, that I'll just uh, draw to the fore because this is so important is own your oddness. There's a chapter called own your oddness for a long time i was depressed partially because i tried to project an avatar an image to the world that wasn't who i really am that's called wow. cognitive dissonance okay. and then when i finally am like you know what i am very hyper i talk really fast and i love to skateboard <laughs> so instead of trying to shove that down i'm just gonna bring it out and that made me so much happier as well probably set you free with some of the gifts that God has already put in your 100%. heart. A hundred percent. Because the world doesn't need another second-rate version of someone else that you're trying to live down to. Like the, the, the I, I have this theory, this philosophy, that when Genesis 1 says we are the likeness and image of God, that each one of us bears a portion of the image of the divine to the world that no one else can. That's why we all have different fingerprints and even tongue prints, because God gave us each unique DNA for that very purpose, which is why your life is so valuable. Whoever you are listening, your life is valuable. You can reflect God in a way that no one else in the world can, and the world needs you. Somebody needs to hear that today. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, something else I'm, I'm curious about. Uh, uh, what age groups? Because it's really easy for us to be stereotypical and go, well, it's young people doing the struggle. But I think everybody is struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you know about that? Well, I mean, this in 2017, the statistic that I reported, it was all the way from mid to late teens to uh, people in their 30s. But you know what's interesting is it, it really is a pandemic particularly targeting young people. Let's think of coronavirus for a moment. It particularly targets the elderly with right. underlying health issues. Now it can affect everybody. Young people can get it too. But I think the same is with depression. There are older people that have it, of course, but it's targeting in, in, in a 
fierce way the young generation right now. And that's why I want to speak to everybody because the Bible says young men are to see visions, old men are to dream dreams, and that's part of the new reality of Pentecost. But at the same time, this is a, a, an issue that's particularly targeting young people. And I wonder if God allowed me to go through depression and healed me so that I can then help other people because our scars become our stars and our wounds become our wisdom. And we can actually manifest the reality reality of Jehovah Rapha, who has the healing balm of Gilead, the God who heals. So I just want to say that to you listening. If you're a young person and you're depressed, can I encourage you that once you get out of this and do not give up, that's the center of everything, you're actually not only going to have joy, you're going to be able to help other people as well, which will give you even more joy in turn. So if you are a young person and maybe uh, a parent is is watching this and, and you're kind of checking this out right now, um, how how can we empower young people to cry out for help who may not know and in Christian parents who don't know how to even receive? There has to be some honesty there so that a connection is made and help is on the way. A huge thing is therapy. You, you have to go get help. And here's what I'll say about this. I, I was skeptical of therapy. You know, like Jungian dream analysis, Freudian Oedipus complexes, yeah. you know, Frankel logotherapy, Adlerian power grabs. I hear all this psychological talk and I'm like, it seems sort of constructed. So the first therapist I went to, good guy, wasn't a good fit. I skateboarded away, said, I'm never going back to therapy. And then I went through a difficult time after my brother died, had gone through some stuff. And my sister said, Ben, you need to go to therapy. Try another therapist. So I tried another counselor and this counselor really helped save my life. I'm being serious about that. So if you're skeptical of therapy, I was too. You might not find it the first try, but be willing to try again. It is, it, your life is important. Your your life is worth saving. So I want to encourage you. Some people say like, oh, therapy isn't biblical. What is that? Second Opinionians 2.12. I've studied the Bible my whole life. I've never once seen a verse that says therapy isn't biblical. In fact, it's the opposite. It says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. The more counselors we can have, the better. So I think that's huge. Go to a counselor. But there's also a point of pride from a parent's perspective. You want to believe things are good. As, as a point of faith, mm -hmm. you want to believe things are going to get better, mm -hmm. and we're just going through a stage. Well, sometimes going through a stage, if suicide's involved, there is no door on the other mm -hmm. side of that. So a, as a parent, I mean, what would you talk mm -hmm. to the parents about who would never consider that their kids are at risk when mm -hmm. indeed they are. Well, consider Alcoholics Anonymous. This is one of the most successful organizations in history. The first thing they have to do is not only acknowledge a higher power, they have to admit they have a problem. And that is a big step for an alcoholic to get to. That's a, that's a difficult place Shoot. to reach to, to be able to say I have a problem. What, 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 why do people stay alcoholics? A lot of times, a lot of times I don't have a problem. I don't have it. So AA, they, you say, I, you have to say in that context, I am an alcoholic and that's what helps them heal. The, same, the reason I'm using that as analogous to depression is because it's the same thing. The way I started to work through my depression is when I wrote in my journal after reading A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis, I said, I have clinical depression. And then later I got diagnosed with all this stuff, but I'm just saying, you have to admit there's a problem. And as a parent, you, you have to be willing to listen to what your kid is saying. And sometimes it's mistaken as a bid for attention by the kid when they cut themselves or when they're complaining of, of even suicide ideation, to which I say, so what if they are using a bid for attention? If they're threatening to take their life to get attention, that doesn't mean you should shun what they're saying or their com the complaints they're making. It means you should give them all the more attention. I always say that, like give them more attention. The first time a character in the Bible named God was Hagar in a desert. She was dying, God rescued her. She said, you are El Roy, the God who sees. That's what we need. We need a God who sees and we image God. So we need to see people too. So really look, see if there's a problem. And once you admit the problem, then you can get the solution. Beautiful. Um, as you're watching 
you need to find out more about Ben Corson. That's who we've been talking to. A huge Instagram account. I think you've got like 150,000 followers or bigger. And uh, just look him up and get your kids involved in him. You'll be involved in him as well. Uh, his book is Flirting with Darkness, which gives you a lot of tips and insights and things that we need. So even if your own family isn't dealing with it, you know somebody's family who is dealing with it and we may not yet have the ability to see that. And we need to be here for other people and be Jesus and wash feet, right? So we'll see you next time.